Hi, and welcome to another episode of Shane Plays Geek Talk. I'm your host, Shane Stacks. Thanks so much for pressing play. This week, we're going to be talking with Levi Combs, who is not only an RPG publisher, tabletop RPG publisher, under the Planet X Games banner, but more importantly, for this episode, he's also a huge fan of Grindhouse Cinema. Now, some of you probably know exactly what Grindhouse Cinema is, others of you may not, but that's what we're going to be talking about uh, in today's episode with Levi. Some of the stuff that you can uh, look forward to hearing is uh, what is Grindhouse and why is it called that? The market forces that led to the rise of Grindhouse theaters. Gritty movies, violent movies, foreign movies, exploitation movies, kung fu movies, Bruce exploitation movies, and more. New York City as a character in movies. Shonuf, the Shogun of Harlem, can choose scenery on a level with Darth Vader. What's Levi's favorite fight scene in any movie, period? Is the first Friday the 13th movie a grindhouse movie? Plus, the RPG adventures and zines of Planet X Games, uh, Hear the Call of the Skeleton and the Black Lake and Behold the Big Eye Chungus. And on that note, uh, if you're just here for the grindhouse portion of the episode then you can jump to about 15 minutes in because the majority of the episode is about Grindhouse Cinema. But we spend a little time at the beginning talking about what Levi does with his tabletop RPG publishing because that's how we met. Um, and I wanted to definitely give him a chance to uh, help promote that stuff. Uh, finally, I just wanted to throw a note out there that um, every now and then I'll do everything I can before an episode starts recording to make sure that the audio sounds good. And then when I am finished recording and I'm checking everything out, I'm like, that doesn't sound as good as I want it to. So Levi's audio in this episode sounds crisp and fantastic. Mine is is not as good as I want it to be in many points. It's still listenable. Uh, it's just not the quality that I would prefer to put out in a podcast. So I've done what I could to help clean it up and, and rest assured that I do take quality of my audio seriously. You know, I test a lot beforehand, so I've got to track down and see where that's happening, because it's not the first time it's happened in one of my episodes. So, oh yeah, I wanted to mention, I want to start mentioning uh, as a point, the previous episode before this one, if you missed it, was episode 258 with Mongoose and Meerkat author Jim Bryfogle, where we get into some swords and sorcery, pulp fiction, adventure fiction type writing with author Jim Bryfogle, so make sure to check that out too. But anyway, this week we're talking with Levi Combs about Grindhouse Cinema, and now, on with the show. Shall, shall, shall we play a game? Why, yes. I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> Getting geeky all up in your podcast. It's Shane Plays Geek Talk. A journey into the things we love. I'm your host, Shane Stacks. Thanks for pressing play for another dose of just all-around geeky goodness. Uh, today, I've got... Um, I've got a cool guest that we're going to cover a couple of topics with. One being uh, his his work in, with uh, role playing games, uh, tabletop role playing game stuff. But two, we're going to be talking about Grindhouse Cinema, which I thought I knew what Grindhouse was, but over the past, I don't know, couple of years, I've 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 been disabused of what I thought Grindhouse was, and since following. Our, my guest on, on Twitter, I've been even further disabused of what I thought Grindhouse was. So with no further ado, we're going to be talking with Levi Combs of Planet X Games. Planet X Games is the uh, the banner that he does his role-playing game stuff under. Uh, but then also he's just a, a, a massive Grindhouse cinema aficionado, if you were. Are we allowed to use big, fancy words when talking about Grindhouse, Levi? I would call myself a grindhouse geek, if anything. Geek, okay. You're grindhouse geek. Yeah, that's better. So, anyway, welcome to the show, Levi. Thanks so much for coming on Shane Plays Geek Talk. No, nah, man. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and, uh, and just so people know, uh, Levi just finished a uh, a mighty battle with some fajitas. So, uh, <laughs> you, were, you were laid out for like 24 hours, man. Did yeah, you, a little food poisoning. <laughs> were those were those home fajitas, or do you want to mention the place where the the fajitas uh, originated from? Was it a chain? Where, where did those uh, fajitas no, sad, come from? Sadly, it was a local spot that I, I frequent often, but uh, yeah. might have to uh, <laughs> might have to back off a little bit. Yeah. 
Well, usually the local spots are are the best, but you know, I uh, it's going to happen. We've all we've all failed our constitution saving throw on occasion against delicious food that uh, left us laid out for like twenty four hours. So, so were you having like at least those good like fever dreams and hallucinations? Did you get anything good out of it? Zero. I got nothing good out of it. Literally, just just laying in bed, wishing I hadn't eaten those fetus. Yeah, yeah. Did you <laughs> did you shake your fist to the cloud? I, I, every time. Every time. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Food poison man shakes fist at, at fate, the, at the cloud <laughs> for the for the fate that's been delivered upon him. All right. Well, anyway, so I, we're going to talk mainly about Grindhouse today because that I mean that that's a a fantastic topic that deserves a show of its own. But before we do all that, I do want to talk about Planet X games. Um, and I also want to give a shout out, of course, to uh, North Texas RPG Con. I think, I, I think I connected with you because of North Texas, probably through like the Facebook group. And then I started following your Twitter and just got to know who you were through there. But I want to give a shout out that, you know, this, this past North Texas RPG Con, that was last week of May, first couple of days of June. Um, of course, and, and, and listeners may not know, but they hear me talking about North Texas RPG Con a lot. Um, in fact, I've dedicated an, an entire show to it at one point. Um, was the the founder Doug Ray uh, passed away over the past year, so he was not physically at this most recent North Texas RPG Con, but he was there in spirit for sure. People definitely talked about him a lot, remembered him. They had a very nice behind the check encounter, a very nice setup, remembering Doug. But what I wanted to, to point out was evidently Doug did a lot of the coordination for the con. Uh, he, he, you know, did a lot of stuff. So this year, Michael Badalato and Gary Oliver stepped up and, and I thought they did a wonderful job. Oh yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. And I saw them having some discussions where I could tell they were having to work stuff out that popped up. Because this stuff always happens when you throw a big event, you got to solve problems. So, uh, you know, they in the in the background they may have been sweating it, but I I thought it was great. Uh, I thought it was probably my favorite North Texas that I've been to so far. Uh, that was my third, and uh, and I heard other people saying it was a really good one too. So I just want to give a shout out to those guys because I know they worked their tails off to make it happen. Yeah, so. North, North, North Texas is. Um... That, it's my favorite con, hands mm-hmm. down. Like um, I, I go to uh, about six cons a year, and uh, the North Texas RPG Con is uh, just far and away my favorite. It's 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 almost like you're going back to like an old like family family reunion, or you're mm-hmm. uh, you're just hitting up a like a high school reunion with people you like. They keep it small and intimate on purpose. They limit. They won't go more than five hundred tickets sold. Right. Um, which I like. I, I'm I'm a very big fan of that. It's like you said. It's like a family reunion. It's it's just fun. And and um, I you know I've been going there enough now and staying engaged with like the Facebook community and whatnot that now I feel like that I'm seeing you know like I'm I'm building those connections and hey, you know running into people and and so I'm getting some some of that that sort of family reunion vibe too. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out to Michael Badalato and uh, Gary Oliver because that's a lot of work. Um, so I just wanted to give them a shout out that that not only did I have a fantastic time at this most recent con, but um, but I heard other people expressing similar sentiments. Let's talk about Planet X Games. Uh, so Levi, tell us a little bit about what you do in gaming in the gaming industry under the banner of Planet X Games. Um, yeah, so Planet X Games really it, it originally started. I was just trying to get my foot in the door um, with uh, with, a, with gaming companies. I I kind of I t- talked to a few people. I didn't really know very many people that that were in the the business. Um, I hate to call it an industry; it's more more of a hobby. Um, yeah, I just didn't know very many people that that uh, that were in it. But the one person I did know was was, was Casey Christopherson. He's the art director and. And uh, one of the you know most prolific writers for um, for Frog God Games and Necromancer Games, um, so he's done a ton of work for them. He did City of Brass, and he did Encephalon Gorges on the Moon. He did the Haunted Highlands for the for the Troll Lords. He he's just a, he's just done a, a ton of stuff. I think he has like eighty or ninety uh, RPG credits to his name. 
but I had um I had met him at a con in Tulsa, Oklahoma, like I don't know, back in the early two thousands, and we just hit it off, and we just kind of always kept in kept in contact. Um, so I, I had an idea for for a module, and I you know had most of it written out, and I was just kind of looking for advice or somebody to kind of put eyes on it. Um, and Casey looked at it, and he was like, "Hey, man, this is this is good. You sh- you should definitely publish this." And I'm like, "Oh, well, I'm just I'm not a publisher. I have no idea." He goes, "Well, why don't you just put it on Kickstarter?" And my response was, "What what's a Kickstarter?" <laughs> Yeah, so um, so it really goes back to that. Casey was my mentor, um, and he was just the guy that picked up the phone. Um, you know, when I had those those questions at at ten o'clock at night, or I was freaking out about my budget, or you know, whatever. He was just always the guy to pick up the phone and be real calm about what he was telling me. And through him, I got to meet some other other folks who also gave me good advice. Uh, Matt Finch um, gave, gave me really good advice. Uh, Jeff Tulaney and and just a couple other folks uh, that were just really, really helpful in helping me get started. And now it's just uh, adventures and zines, and they span everything from the OSR all the way to 5th edition to Dungeon Crawl Classics. Um, I've even done a couple system agnostic zines, which I really, really enjoyed. Um, but yeah, we play this games. It's, it's more of a cinematic take on role-playing. Um, so if you take, so like for an OSR product, you know, the, you've got your, your framework of rules, but like, how can we take that and how can we make it just a little bit more, uh, cinematic? How can it be a little bit more action packed? Um, and I, and I don't, I don't mean that necessarily in the, in the frame of like, you know, combat or, or rolling dice, but it's like, let's just see what we can do to, to, to spice that up. How, how do we present it a little bit better? How do we make the, the flow of play a little bit easier? And that's all that is. So, speaking of the phylactery, I have a couple of issues here. Oh, um, sweet. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I supported them either, either through, I guess, Kickstarter or Indiegogo. I'm assuming Kickstarter. Uh, I got issues. It's the issue. Uh, I got the MTRPG exclusive where there's a big D20. Uh, oh, on the front yes. Of number, number two. And then I've got uh, like a skeletal knight. I know Ed Bickford did one of these. Uh, yeah, Ed Bickford did the cover of the sort of skeletal knight, and the other one, the Coney is the cover is Tony Avina. Uh, so I got to give a shout out to Ed. I'm pretty sure, although I looking through these, I've loved looking at them, um, and they've got good material, great art. But I think Ed Bickford was pushing the phylactery, which is why I supported it before I even realized that it was connected with you. So um, so we can get we give Ed a little thumbs up on that one. I think he's the guy I've done most the most work with, um, you know. Between all all of, I think I have thirteen books out now. And I think he's he has the most covers and the most um, the most interiors of, of of any anybody I've worked with. So um, if you can't tell, I'm a big fan of Ed. Yeah, no, it's a cool guy. I actually, I had him on uh, within the past year. I think after I met him at the last more Texas RPG con and talked with him and kept him in touch since kept in touch with him since then. But yeah. So talking about the phylactery, the zine. So just so uh, stuff to kind of give an idea of what you might find strange things that live underground, weird critters, uh, worm polyps from the void beyond an undead gut pile, brood hive of the slime God. It doesn't get any better than that. Brood hide or brood hive of the slime God. Um, one D tents, tough SOBs, roadhouse hoodlums, board adventures, and mean old bastards you might meet in a tavern. So, um, and the, the art's great, the the style's great. It's uh, it's not all old school, but it has that kind of gritty feel. So, um, so anyway, that's the phylactery. Then you have another zine called what? Ray guns and robots. Is yeah, Ray, I've, I've got a ton of zines, but uh, ray guns and robots is one of them. It's, that's one of the system agnostic zines. It's kind of like my love letter to um, pulp sci-fi and um, old school vintage, like atomic sci-fi, um, yep. and something really that came came was born out of out of all this extra artwork that that Ed had laying around. Like he had been doing this robot pulp comic for a long time. And he just had a bunch of this killer artwork, and I was like, "Hey, man, we should do a zine together. You do the art, and I'll do the the words." And um, yeah, it really it really really worked out. And then you're, it looks like that you are about to kickstart uh it says the skeleton of the blake or the blake the black lake calls for thee three curses for sister saren uh 
which is obviously a play on three mules for Sister Sarah, right? Um, well, launch, launches on Kickstarter soon. Um, so what, tell us a little bit about that. When is that Kickstarter going to hit? So that'll probably be in September. Um, I'll actually have an, another one coming before then. Um, okay, what is that? We, we were going to put it on Indiegogo, but um, then Kickstarter announced that they wanted to do um, – Zine Quest, like out of nowhere, for August. We're going to do a Zine Quest in August and another one in February. So we're like, I guess we're going to do something cool in August. Because, uh, I, I, like I said, I had it earmarked for, for Indiegogo, uh, actually for this Tuesday. Um, but we switched it over to, um, to, uh, to August. And that's a project called uh, Big Eye Chungus. Big Eye Chungus. And all I can really say about it is that it's about the coolest monster that has ever floated its way through a dungeon and blasted you to pieces with its eye rays. Right. Yeah. Probably, uh, one of one of the most well known and iconic um, types of monsters besides a dragon. So, well, I don't know what you're talking about, man. I no, mean, no, uh, I, don't, yeah, I, I no. mean, on, honestly, it's uh, you know, a, a, a ch- it's it's a, it's a big eye chungus. I don't. Yeah, know. Yeah, it's, it's a big eye chungus. It's a chungus among us that has big eyes. Uh, and I, it, I would I would only say that you should behold this zine when it when it stands. Yeah, yeah. Behold, behold uh, <laughs> the scene when it watches. All right. So, Big Eye Chungus <laughs> will be coming before Three Curses for Sister Saren. Anyway, folks, uh, check out Planet X Games. What, what's the best way that you like people to follow Planet X uh, Games? I'm, I'm all over social media. You can follow me on Facebook at Planet X Games, uh, Twitter at Planet X Games. Co as in company C O, and then on um, Instagram I have a uh, a pretty a pretty regularly updated feed uh, just called It Came from Beyond Planet X. It came from Beyond Planet X, and then website wise, uh, you've got some stuff up on Drive Through RPG, and then I found a collection of your products on the Exalted Funeral dot com or Exalted Funeral dot com. Yeah. So is that the closest thing you have to like to an actual website? Yeah, so the, our, the okay. web store is the web store is Exalted Funeral. They all, have all of our latest stuff up. Okay. Um, obviously, things go out to backers first, and then we give a little bit of a two or three week grace period so that people who ordered uh, from out of the country get their copies before we offer it to anybody else. Um, but once everybody has their copies, everything goes up on Exalted Funeral, and um, they're really, really good about getting product out quickly and getting you know promoting, and um, they're great partners. Right. Drive through RPG. There's a few things on there, a few of my earliest things, but I, I stopped using them um, quite a while ago. I, ha- I haven't actually updated or used yeah, it. It looked like there was only about three products on there, if I remember yeah. right. So, okay. Yeah, it's the earliest stuff. And folks, just to remind you, so it's Planet X Games, Levi Combs. Uh, picking, I've got a copy of the Phylactery magazine here. I just randomly opened the page. It said, Secrets from the Lich's Crypt, a whole bunch of weird old crap in a dead wizard's lab. Uh, <laughs> a rod of keening death. Now, if that does, and a ring of eldritch might, ring of eldritch might. And then on a further page, we have Malug, the bloated one. Now, if that doesn't, if that doesn't get you excited, I can't help you. So, uh, all right. So check out Planet X Games, and they got upcoming cool stuff and all kinds of madness. Uh, but what we're really here to talk about. And I can have you on in the future, and we can talk exclusively Planet X. Um, but you were keen, and I was keen to have you talk about Grindhouse Cinema. So, <laughs> all right, let's talk about. Okay, so this is going to be this is an interesting topic because it's one of those things people will differ what they either think Grindhouse is or the quote unquote official definitions of what Grindhouse is. Um, it's a style. It's an era. It's all these different things. There's there's stuff. There's movies now that might come. Out, somebody could say, "Well, that's a grindhouse movie." Well, all, all, all those all those answers are correct. Well, that's the thing. That's the point. So it's both wonderfully um, inclusive, but also slippery. So let's just get that out on the front end. But I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a couple of dick uh, of uh, definitions out here. None of which are accurate. All of which are. <laughs> okay, so Mer- Merriam Webster. Remember in the old days before where they would say, "Ask Mister Webster." Uh, the definition of grindhouse is an often shabby movie theater having continuous showings, especially 
of pornographic or violent films. Now, I don't think we're uh, we'll definitely be focusing on violent films today. I don't think we're going to be focusing on pornographic films. Um, well, that, that, it, that, 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 that definition is, is pretty correct, actually. Yeah. Um, well, for what Grindhouse, like, like, you know, if you think of in the 70s, like, um, like Times Square had all those little movie theaters that were showing yes, stuff. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's Grindhouse. Okay. 42nd Street. Right, Grindhouse can be like the type of theater, but then also the kind of movie. All right, Wikipedia talks about um, the origins of the term, and there's a historian named David Church, and he said this theater type was named after the quote-unquote grind policy, a film programming strategy dating back to the early 1920s, which continuously showed films at cut-rate ticket prices that typically rose over the course of each day. And then finally... um, Wiktionary, which is like a open source dictionary, I guess, um, play on Wikipedia. Uh, it, it's got a couple of options of where it came from. Uh, perhaps the grinding or cranking motion employed by early projectionists, and perhaps from bump and grind, uh, which and they say this is a dubious uh, possibility. It says the term may originally have been used for burlesque houses in the 1940s, and it was used in at least one instance, to describe a burlesque house. But from what I understand, the most common understanding is for quite a time, uh, what, 50s, 60s, 70s, maybe a little bit of the 80s, you had these theaters that would just grind as many movies through them as they could. It, 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 It may only run there for a day or two, if that. But they would show multiple different movies per day and just low cost low budget movies, grind as many of them in there and and you know get people to come in and, and buy cheap tickets and, and make money on volume. That's what I understand is is probably the most common accepted thing is that that thing of grindhouse. Now having said all that, what what is what is your definition? Where where do you think the term came from, Levi? Well no, it's it's all pretty close to that. Um to my understanding a grindhouse the, the term grindhouse uh, comes from exactly what you said. With uh, you'd, you'd have these shabby, low rent theaters um, all across the, the country, but they really grew in prominence. Uh, the, the, they got really well known for being uh, Times Square, Forty Second Street uh, area in New York. Um, but they would they would have exploitation films, violent films, uh, genre, very genre specific films. Uh, and really just very cheaply made um, movies that they could get for cheap, you know, like, so while across, you know, across the, you know, across the city, somebody might be showing uh, Star Wars or Jaws or something like that. Well, you know, at, on 42nd Street, they were showing Exterminator 2, you know, or they were showing, you know, uh, I, I spit uh, on your grave. Or yeah, whatever. It, it, yeah, exactly. No, but you know you have. Uh, I, I've heard the the notion that you know, they were called grand houses because of the of of uh, pornographic films and you know and uh, you know the 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 women grinding on you know however right. however you want to put it. Um, but that's I, I don't believe that's accurate. Everything that I've read kind of counteracts uh, that that terminology, um, and I, I I don't really think that that that's the the terminology that they would have used. That doesn't that doesn't sound accurate for the period to me. Um, yeah, I mean, I just think of it as I think the most accurate thing is grinding through as many cheap movies as they could. That's, yes, that's kind of yes. how I think of it. But uh, and, and another, if you want to capture the atmosphere of what now a grindhouse movie is different from a grindhouse theater, but if you want to capture that essence of a grindhouse theater, there's that scene in Taxi Driver. Yep, that's it. Where where um, Robert De Niro asks. Who? That's not Sybil Shepherd. Who is that? That's in the movie. Uh, anyway, it is Sybil Shepherd. Is it, it? Shepherd? Sybil Shepherd. He asks her out for a date. She says yes, and he takes her into this, uh, you know, cheap little movie theater. And it's it's it, they're basically showing a porno, and she gets up and leaves. That that's a grindhouse theater, you know. Um, yes. No, not, yeah. that's not saying that all grindhouse theaters showed pornography. Right, but that's but that, it's that type of cheap little. You know. Yeah, you you could expect um, if you went to a grand house theater in say the late seventies, you could expect to see a, a junkie nodding off in the corner, people 
just smoking in the theater. Um, you'd see, you know, prostitutes come in with their johns. Um, it was not a not a sanitary or clean place by by, by any stretch of the imagination. But um, it, it was it was in that. It, it was in that pre uh, Giuliani cleanup of, of, yeah. uh, of the nineties that, that that's when, uh, you know, yeah. all that stuff's gone now. That's long, long gone. Um, but before that cleanup, you know, when times square was, was truly a dangerous place, like, I don't know if you, if you'd ever in, in your travels as a younger man, if you'd ever made your way there before uh, times square got cleaned I, up. I have not, but between movies, pop culture, comic books and reading history, I know it was a rough place. <laughs> so yeah, it was really uh, just a, it's just a dangerous place. You know, Get, getting mugged was not uncommon, but you know, you would. You yeah. just, hey, you, I, hey, I saw Death Wish. I know what it was <laughs> like. <laughs> no, uh, the only person who could walk around uh, boldly in Times Square with no fear was Jason Voorhees. So anybody <laughs> else, you had to watch it. So, uh, <laughs> that's a that, that, that's a good. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was that was definitely pre Giuliani Times Square. That little sequence in Jason Takes Manhattan. Even though most of Jason Takes Manhattan happens on a boat, we're only in Manhattan for about fifteen minutes. But anyway, my childhood wasn't ruined. I'm not bitter. Um, <laughs> actually, I like that movie. I, I love, I love that movie. Actually, hey, where else can you watch a boxing match where uh, Jason boxes the guy's head off? Um, okay, you can so, see that in. Uh, hey, you could actually see that in um, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Outer Space. I, you know, I haven't watched that since I was a teenager. I remember watching that in high school. I need to see it's it. It's gloriously again. amazing. It yeah. still holds up. It's still Does awesome. It? Yeah. I oh my gosh, was, I love yeah, it. Yeah, I remember like the killer cotton candy and all kinds of crazy. And the shadow, the shadow puppet. Each oh, yeah. It. yeah. It's, 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 it's still an amazing movie. Yeah. It, if, if, it, if anything deserves a remake. Or it's deserves kind of like a very late sequel, or like a team up with another franchise. You know, get like uh, Killer Clowns versus I don't know Evil Dead or uh, Killer Clowns versus I don't know Jason or something. That that would be my my you know my Killer my Clowns versus it. Uh, yeah. Killer Killer Clowns versus uh, is it Terrifier that is kind of a clown looking killer? Yeah, oh yeah, uh, clown. Killer Clowns versus Puppet Master. I'm down with that. Uh, okay. So, uh, but yeah, that that would that would be a fun mashup to have them fight. Um, Evil Dead, I think. Actually, Ash versus Ke- uh, Killer Clowns. I'd pay money to see Ash versus all day, Killer every Clowns. day. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. So, yeah, shop smart, shop s smart. Okay, we talked a little bit about what what Grindhouse, what where, where the term came from. You know, the another sort of historical point was that used to like theaters were these amazing experiences were, you know, it was like, uh, you know, they incredibly lavish and curtains and ushers and, uh, you know, this really nice experience. Well, one of the reasons for the rise of Grindhouse was uh, TV. Yep. Theaters started having to compete with TV. So you've got a theater that needs to stay in business. So it changes its business model. So that was not the only reason, but one of the reasons for the rise of Grindhouse was I could just set I can just set my butt at home and watch TV. So uh, we well, had we well, had all these um, luxurious theaters that were no longer be taken care of, no longer being right. taken care of down in the heart of New York City, and um, you know that that's that's not free rent. You know they got to figure out some way to, right. to, to to pay the nut. So. And here's another, this is, doesn't have to do with Grindhouse, but this is trivia as long as we're talking about movies. Uh, from what I understand, the reason that popcorn got so popular is because during the Great Depression, one of the main things that people like to do was go to the movies. And it was a cheap treat. So uh, that I've heard that that's one of the reasons why we associate popcorn with movies. Oh, I never heard that. It makes sense. Anyway, so let's talk about let's talk about actual grindhouse movies. Now, here's here's what surprised me because you know, you and I have talked on Twitter a couple of times. I'm like, oh, I never thought of that as a grindhouse movie. And you're like, nope, that's definitely grindhouse. So I always thought of grindhouse as basically cheap, grainy exploitation movies, for the most part. Right? Uh and, there, and so I, I started digging through lists of 
whether considered some of the best grindhouse movies out there. And there's some on there that I, I, I considered independent, but I never thought of them as grindhouse. So I'll, I'll give you some examples that surprise me. Halloween, 1978. Yep. Never thought of that as grindhouse. Uh, you know, I always think of grindhouse as like, because I remember Halloween being a big movie that everybody talked about, right? But it didn't start out that way. But it became that a lot like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It started. It started out as this little independent film that nobody was watching, and then when people saw it, the word of mouth became so contagious that it spread, and then they got huge. Right. Um, so, because I, I mean, I can remember like being in elementary school and like walking to school, and all the kids talking about Halloween. Right. Um, I can remember. It, it just, you know, it didn't, it did, I would not have classified that as grindhouse. So there's always more to learn, which is why I like to do these shows. Um, I, I would have thought, before I started doing deeper, deeper research, I would have thought as grindhouse as a fun little movie that totally forgettable, but it was fun for the moment that I watched it, like, like a piece of bubble gum, right? Quick little entertainment, move on. But there's some movies in Grindhouse that are considered Grindhouse that I think are very powerful movies. Um, here's another movie that surprises me that it's considered Grindhouse, and that's Dawn of the Dead. Mm -hmm. Because, A, that's Romero, so I hold Romero way up there, you know, especially on his original trilogy. Uh, and, I mean, I guess I would have thought of that as independent, but... Again, not necessarily Grindhouse. Like, I don't see that as a cheap throwaway movie. One, because I love zombie movies, and I think it's probably the best zombie movie ever made, in my opinion. Um, even surpassing Night of the Living Dead, which I love dearly. Uh, but it's also got a powerful message about consumerism and the emptiness of people's lives, right? That whole mall with the zombies walking around the mall. I mean, Romero is making some very powerful messages there. So it's not just some cheap bubblegum, I watched it once, I forgot about it kind of movie. Uh, and then the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, again, I wouldn't have thought of that as grindhouse, but now that I think about it, like Toby Hooper made that on like a really small budget, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I guess it, and I guess the amount of fame a movie gets shouldn't relate to whether it's grindhouse or not. That's something that I need to adjust in my, in my personal definition. So, uh, another movie that I wouldn't consider grindhouse because I don't think it was an easy movie to make. I don't think of it as low budget and it's a very powerful movie is cannibal Holocaust. That I wouldn't have thought of as ground as grindhouse. Cause I don't, you know, that, that could not have been an easy, cheap movie to make, uh, in my opinion, cause they had to, they had to film it in both the city and they had to film it in what the Amazon, or maybe they were using other locations to look like the Amazon, but that, that had a super powerful message in it, you know, about the, uh, you know, the twist where you think that it's just these college kids that got in trouble, but the college kids were really the monsters. So, um, but anyway, those are some examples that, that I was like, wow, that I didn't, I didn't really thought of those as grand. So now, a movie that makes a lot of lists that I'm like, yeah, that's totally Grindhouse is Death Race 2000. To me, that's perfect. That's a perfect example of Grindhouse would be Death Race 2000. That's a good. That's a good one. It feels cheaply made, but it's a lot of fun, and it's over the top and it's violence and everything. You know, like like Frankenstein goes for the doctors to get more points instead of the patients that they're setting out for, you know, that kind of thing. With me throwing just those movies out, like Gator Bait, that's another movie that, that I enjoy that I'm like, okay, that's definitely a Grindhouse movie is Gator Bait. Um, and then I threw, a, I threw another one in here. I was kind of making a list of stuff that, you know, I, for my list of Grindhouse favorites, I had started working on it. It's not comprehensive. I put Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Death Race 2000, Gator Bait, and then I did an honorable mention of zombie, which I don't love zombie as much as a lot of people do, but the shark fight, it's, there's no other movie where you have a zombie fighting a shark and that's, that's big stuff. So zombie made my honorable mention list for that. So, you know, why don't you give us some examples or, you know, what, what you think of is a grindhouse movie and give us some examples of your favorites. Well, the, 
there's a lot to unpack from what you just said. Let me backtrack just a little bit. So if you go to Grindhouse Cinema Database, um, which is you know one of the most popular, uh, right? I'm on their. I have their top twenty pulled up. Right. If you go to Grindhouse Cinema Database, you'll see movies that fit um, the. You they just fit the aesthetic of of Grindhouse stuff that came either earlier or later when the actual when the actual movies were being pushed through actual grind houses, which kind of ends at eighty five eighty six. Is that's that's kind of when uh, a lot of those um, those films, uh, a lot of those places started to disappear. Um, but you see uh, not only those kind of films, but you see ones that have the aesthetic or have like the the homage and the vibe of of Grand House. And then you see stuff that is uh, can be can be considered grindhouse, but it's um, exploitation or genre, very genre specific material. Like you mentioned, Gator Bait. Gator Bait comes from what they call hicksploitation, um, which uh, would just be basically you know a whole a whole series definitive era of movies where um, the villains or the protagonists were. Um, rednecks or hillbillies, or a good example of a of, of of that sort of film would be like Hills Have Eyes, right. or Texas Chainsaw Massacre, or um, gosh, is this little I, uh, what is it, the Sp- Spider Baby? Yeah, and and the Hills Have Eyes, that's a hard movie for me to watch. I watch a lot of horror movies, and they don't bother me, but that one gets under my skin. Um, the Hills Have Eyes is a you know they're just that normal little. Uh, suburban family, you know, caught out in the middle of all that. It, it's just awful, <laughs> you know. And it's like, I, I don't know. There's something about the hills have eyes that gets me. That's all I can say. Yeah, there's a there's a, a a lot of different kind of movies that you could that you could put under the the umbrella that is Grindhouse. Um, when we start talking about you know subgenres, you get into stuff like nun exploitation. You know, where it's right. the, the 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 protagonist is is uh, is a nun, or there's like heavy heavy themes of Catholicism, and like I said, you had hick exploitation. There's cannibal exploitation, which uh, you know, cannibal Holocaust obviously falls into. But you know, so does uh, something like uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre again. Well, let, let me stop you there. It's, uh, I do. I'm, I want to make a point to see like where you think the line of Grindhouse begins and ends. So I think it was Eli Roth made The Green Inferno, which uh, have you seen that? I have. Okay. In some ways, that's kind of cannibal holocaust. But would you consider the Green Green Inferno grindhouse? See, I, I consider Green Inferno to have much more modern budget and sensibilities. And while the story itself might be grindhouse-ish with some of the awful, brutal stuff that happens in it, I don't really consider it a grindhouse movie. But how would you consider it? Well, it, it, again, it again, depends on what you consider to be a grindhouse movie. Like, is it just a movie with Grindhouse aesthetics? Is it a movie that was produced to be to be played in actual Grindhouses between this date and this date? Right. Is it a is it an homage film that uh, is uh, obviously riffing off of a of a previous film? Is it a remake? There's all kinds of different different uh, things that fall under that umbrella. Now, if you look at the, that cinema, uh, the, the Grindhouse Cinema database, you'll see that they kind of they kind of put everything underneath that umbrella. And that includes, you know, um, just B movies in general, uh, but also stuff that could be considered basically like the kind of the trashy VHS sort of releases that you would see in your um, in your um, neighborhood uh, VHS rental place. But when you talk about Eli Roth's Green Inferno, that's a special case, I think, because um, Eli Roth, again, one of the directors that helped bring back um, the enthusiasm and the interest in Grand House, along with obviously like Quentin Tarantino. Um, but then he has specifically said, Hey, this is my reimagining of cannibal Holocaust. Cause he was incredibly uh, influenced by, by uh, cannibal Holocaust. So when he did green Inferno, that's what I'm saying. Cannibal Holocaust is a very powerful movie. It, it, yeah. it, it, it is a disturbing movie, but it's, it, but it's, it's, it's got a lot of brutality in it. It also has like a message, you know, because uh, everyone thinks that oh, this 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 was a, like these four college filmmakers they're lost with these awful savages. It's terrible, and then when the real truth comes out, I mean, it makes you think. And 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 so, like I said, you know, it's a grindhouse. 
era movie for sure. It's got grindhouse sensibilities, but it, it it Cannibal Holocaust. I would, despite its awful brutality, and there's a lot of brutality in it, I don't consider it a uh, a throwaway piece of bubblegum entertainment. You know, and it's also for me. I'm a huge found footage fan guy. Um, I have well, a. I, 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 I'll back you up right there. I would. I would not. Not. I mean, I, I see that you're putting uh, grindhouse films into the throwaway piece of bubblegum yeah. entertainment. I, I would call VHS trash. Right. That's what I would call that. But there are okay. so, no, many, right. so many grindhouse films that are very impactful and very, uh, and not even the ones that were that, that we've been talking about, but so many that that are just really, really um, deal with a lot of very mature themes. And you know, had they been in the hands of maybe just a slightly better director or had a bigger budget. Maybe you would have seen, you know, seen or heard more out of them. But, um, you know, some there's some films out there, man, that that'll, you know, given their context, will sh- you know, just sh- shock you to the core. Can you can you think of any examples off the top of your head? Yeah, I'm I'm just thinking of, uh, it's so silly to think about. Um, but there's a movie called uh, Exterminator, yeah. um, and it's about a guy who comes back from the, the Vietnam War, and um, you know, he's got a flamethrower and he's killing. Cr- he's kind of a riff rock Death Wish. Right, but um, you know, you think about Death Wish. That was another movie that you know didn't immediately gain that crazy popularity. But if you start going through those lists of movies and start, uh, I forget there's there's uh, oh there's a lot of um, they call them black exploitation films, but they're just they're just genre specific um, um, right, films yeah, right. that, that were made that were made with with black directors and black actors that are um, some of them are are you know have, have, again have those those really really mature themes. Um, and some some of them are fantastic, you know. They're just like any other uh, any other genre, you know. You got your good ones and your bad ones, but um, I mean, I challenge you to sit down and watch the Mac or you know <laughs> Willie Dynamite and not not come away with something because you know some of, some of these movies are just you know these these um, exploitation movies. You know they they maybe they, again maybe they didn't have the, the the right director or the right budget or maybe they didn't have a, a great big um, they didn't have a huge um, uh, budget for actors, but you know what? What came out of that was was just this genuine, a genuine glimpse of what, of, of what the story really was, and, and you, you really get some magic on screen. So I wouldn't call them uh, like these throwaway bubblegum things. But some of them certainly are, but um, I mean, if you, you ever watch the Warriors, you ever see that? The Warriors, yeah. Absolutely. Warriors. There's a scene. In, yeah, there, there's a scene. Hey, yeah. 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 The, the, there's there's a scene in the Warriors that I will hold up against any any scene that's ever been in in cinema ever, um, where um, the what hero, the yeah, the hero, the hero and his 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 girlfriend are basically on the on on the subway. That is such a power. I know the exact scene you're talking yeah. about, and the and the fans. Oh, I'll let you tell it, but that's one. That is a very powerful scene. I mean, if you already know it, it's it, 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 no, it, it, for, it, for the yeah. listeners. Yeah, for the listeners. So yeah, go ahead and finish it out. I mean, it's just it's just a uh, it's it's a great scene. Um, you get uh, the uh, basically the protagonists. Uh, they they get onto a to a subway and they're they're dirty and filthy. They've been you know, people have been trying to kill them all night, and they get on the subway and um, the car, and then the. Uh, a bunch of people, I guess, coming from a from a disco or from a prom or something. I don't, I, I don't right, right, rightfully recall, but they also get on the, the train at the same moment, and they're sitting across from each other. And uh, the protagonist's girlfriend, she kind of kind of goes to like kind of pull up her her her, her shirt, um, you know, which has been ripped and torn because you know people, like I said, people have been trying to kill him the entire time. And um, he stops her because he's like, "Hey, we, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of. We are who we are." But they they managed to they managed to convey all of that through a whole like forty five seconds of just silence and just just physical acting. It's just it's fantastically directed, fantastically acted, and you can't watch that and not feel some sort of impact. It's, oh, it's definitely, just a, yeah. That's it, it. That's the that's the moment where probably you stop seeing the warriors as as two dimensional, but they're like real people that you can empathize with. Right. You know? So like, you know, yeah. the, 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 the whole movie, you know, you got the gang, these gangs are all trying to kill, you know, there's like 40 gangs are trying to kill this one gang, you know, and, 
there's all this kind of silly stuff with people dressed up like, you know, baseball right. teams and, you know, the people with makeup on that are, you know, looking like clown, you know, whatever. But all this, all, all this kind of crazy stuff that's a metaphor for uh, um, all the different kind of uh, p- power plays in, in, in the New York underground at that time. But, um, but then you get this really soulful, like, like heavy moment, like right smack dab in the middle of the film. You're like, whoa, hold on. Like, like what yeah. did I just watch? Like this well, is so powerful. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I knew I mean, I knew immediately where you're going as soon as you brought it up. So, uh, so yeah, I agree. It's very powerful. See, and that's another movie I would not have thought of as Grindhouse. Um, you know, because I, I saw it on HBO mixed in with all the other movies, right? So to me, it just seemed like another movie. Um, but it, it, if, if people have never seen The Warriors, it's it's an amazing movie. Of course, it has the famous scene at the end where the guy's got the bottles on his fingers and he's smacking them together and saying the warriors come out and play in that really. You'd be surprised how many actors from that movie went on to just be in tons of other things, you know, and that's definitely a movie that does not have any sort of modern sensibility attached to it. So, um, you know, if you're you're, you're a listener, if you're out there watching it, there's, there's, there's some, some rough scenes to watch in that movie. So just, uh, yeah, let's throw a, a, a caveat. Um, you know, Shane Plays Geek Talk, uh, any conversations I have on Shane Plays Geek Talk are, are family friendly for the most part, but some of the stuff we're talking about may not be. <laughs> so, you yeah, know, well, that's, uh, that's the nature of Grindhouse in general, I think, uh, because those, 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 those films, they're, they're, they're dirty. And they're um, the raw, like said, they're in your face, very yeah. much. The, well, and, you know, yeah. not, sometimes not in, not in a great way. Um, yeah. They can be the, the the term is exploitation film, and I mean, yeah, they are, they are some 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 of them, not all of them, but some of them are very exploitative. Um, yeah. It was just the seventies, sixties, even early eighties. This is a different time, man. That was it was a wild west. You know, this is before the and, and see, I I grew up in it, so I'm fine with it. I miss it in some ways. Um, not that I want people to be exploited, but it's just a part of the, it's just part of the nostalgia and the zeitgeist that I grew up in. Uh, and there's also a freedom in being able in being able to make you know movies that are raw and in your face. Uh, so uh, you know, so to me. Uh, these, these, and these are also very important titles. One of the reasons I love watching older movies and retro TV, and all the and reading old comic books and all that, is because it's the closest to time travel we're ever going to get, other than reading like a historical autobiography or something, um, to see what the sensibilities of the day were. Or even if you watch an old movie and you see the backdrop of the uh, backdrop of the street for what people are wearing and what's what kind of cars and the stuff that's in the uh display windows and all i I just love this stuff but then you get that raw gritty almost dangerous it's almost dangerous to be watching this you know um but you were were talking about exploitation and uh you know the warriors and, and some of these movies having a heart or a message that may be surprising i was watching um it wasn't that long ago. I can't remember if it was Blackula or if it was Scream, Blackula, Scream, which, of course, is they took Dracula and made him black and called him Blackula, right? That's a very exploitation-type thing to do. But a, an underlying theme of the movie was he was just trying to have a relationship with a woman and be left alone. And, yeah, I think I think it's almost a disservice to call it to, to to I mean not that this is what you're trying to do, but it's a disservice for people who who would immediately think that Blackula is is just Black Dracula. There's so much more to Right. It. No, it's very deep, right? Yeah. Yeah, um it's very deep and he's struggling with things and it's not just some little two-dimensional story. It was very powerful. Um he just wanted to be with his woman and he was expressing to her the the pain of his existence and um, I, I mean, it was really good. So uh, surprisingly uh, strong. Another example, this isn't grindhouse, but another example of, of stuff that people may be think is, is not very powerful 
but you get these moments like there's a a Tom Baker Doctor Who arc. You know, most people, a lot of people, like I love classic Who, and who a lot of people think of classic Who is just cheesy old BBC stuff. But there's like an episode where Tom Baker has like the fate of the Daleks in his hands. He's literally got these two little wires, and if he puts them together, he destroys the Daleks. And he has this incredible agonizing self-discussion where does he have the right to do this and, and all of the, and it's really powerful stuff. So again, I'm not saying that old doctor was grindhouse, but just because something is old or cheaply made or perceived as throwaway doesn't mean it is. So no, absolutely, uh, you're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but hey, you had asked me, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, you, you had asked me what my uh, favorite grindhouse films were. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And I think if we're throwing out like a really wide umbrella, like like say that the Grindhouse Cinema Database does, I and mean, we're we're getting in, you know, all the trashy VHS uh, films and all the B movies and uh, all all and all the homages since, I think we're casting out that. Um, it, mine's pretty broad. Like obviously I, the stuff that we've talked about before, you know, there's Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Halloween. These are all classics of, of, of the genre that I can watch a thousand times over. Um, but if I boil it down to like, what, what do I really like to watch and rewatch over and over again? It's got to be, um, I l- really like Evil Dead 2. Yep. Um, that's a great one. Uh, if you've ever seen Troll 2. No, but that makes, that, it doesn't, that, isn't there a documentary about that saying it's the worst movie ever made? Yeah, well, the documentary is called Best Worst Movie. Uh, If you have not, I'm I'm telling you, if you have not experienced Troll 2, then when we're done with this podcast, you put aside whatever you have done, go find it streaming, as I'm sure it's streaming somewhere, and watch it. And then when you have a chance, watch the documentary uh, shortly thereafter. And it it will change your perception of, of all everything we've talked about. It'll blow your mind. So I didn't rush out and watch it immediately, frantic confession there. But I did watch Troll 2 before I finished editing this episode. And it is, boy, it's a movie. Out of all the movies I've ever seen, it's definitely one of them. I could see it having a certain charm. It it is a bad movie, but it's a very watchable bad movie. Uh, I went on to watch... Worst Bad Movie, or Best Worst Movie, I think is the name of the documentary. Uh, you can watch it for free on, on Tubi. Uh, documentary is very good. It has much more heart than it has any right to, to be honest, uh, kind of talking to the different actors, especially the main guy who played the dad. He's just a really super likable guy. Yeah, Troll 2 is it's a phenomenon. If you watch this documentary, I mean, it is, it's connected with people on a, on a crazy level. Uh, so definitely check it out if you haven't already. I have to say that, you know, upon one viewing, I didn't connect with it on that magical level that it has with a lot of people, but I did enjoy it. And it's very quotable and, and a lot of fun. I suspect the more you watch it, the more it just builds and builds and builds um, until it becomes this sort of experience. But there, it is the definition of a cult classic. There is an entire cult around this movie. Uh, so go check out Troll 2 if you haven't already. So is Troll 2, did that have Jennifer Aniston? Am I getting confused? No, that's Leprechaun. Leprechaun, okay. Yeah. Troll 2, go watch Troll 2. That has a documentary about it called Best Worst Movie. Yes. So there's Troll 2, and then if, if you've never seen Samurai Cop. Okay. If you've never seen Samurai Cop, I, I honestly don't even know where to begin with it as far as the insanity that ensues from the first opening reel to the end. <laughs> It's so crazy. It's such a just a, a bonkers, just absolutely crazy film. Um, it, again, without just spoiling the best parts of it, just trust me. Like even in the slow parts, keep watching. Keep keep looking for those those movie mistakes. Keep looking for those cameos. And then when when the the bad lines come, it, yeah. it's like a, it's like something that you just you can't even believe in. Cherish oh, them. It's amazing. So let me ask you this. Since you mentioned Samurai Cop, that made me think of, uh, here's an example. Like, I don't, this I would say it's not Grindhouse because it's, it's just this bonkers parody uh, of, of many things, but like Kung Fury. 
Have yeah. You, okay. I would. Would you call that? Because I'm saying they're just that's its own thing off being like this wacky parody, fun. Would you consider that Grindhouse? No. Um, okay. So we bring. It's funny you bring up Kung Fury because um, you know the whole the whole aspect of of Grindhouse films that we haven't even touched on are the Shaw Brothers and the Wuxia movies and all the all the imports that came over and basically changed the the entire face of. Well, right, like the 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 Saturday or Sunday afternoon kung fu theater, baby. Yeah, um, like well, yeah. I mean, you know, Br- Bruce Lee and yeah. his with his popularity began to soar, really made all that possible. But then you had all the movies that were being shown in the in the you know these literally in in the grind houses because they were they were cheap. You could get them for next to nothing, and then you could just show them over and over again. And what they would do is they would take these movies and they would they would um, put them in impoverished neighborhoods. And then the pe- people would just fill these theaters, um, and that's how they turned, you know, they, they turned a dime on some of these uh, theaters that were. But then it got into the culture, right? Like, yeah, there's a great there's a great book that just came out about this very thing called um, "These Fists Break Bricks," and it's like it's pretty much like the the book about um, about kung fu and martial arts cinema going all the way back to like the 20s and 30s, like when you wouldn't even think that you would see that sort of thing in, in, you know, in a movie all the way up until the modern day. Like it's, it's, if you're interested in this subject at all, it is absolutely invaluable. It'll be like a feast for your brain. Um, again, it's called these fists break bricks. All right, um, that. It's fully illustrated. They've got everything in there. They're, they're dropping count Dante references. They're talking about all of, of the Shaw brothers films and all of like all the Bruce exploitation. Like after Bruce Lee died, there, there were all these like exploitation films that, that were just basically ripping off his likeness. They called it Bruce exploitation. Oh my goodness. You have like Bruce Lee, Bruce Lai, Bruce Lay, and then, you know, a thousand ver- variations on those. But um, it's just a, it, that, that whole era of, of Shaw brothers. Well, then you had parodies of that because you had, what was it? They call me Bruce in the early eighties. Yeah, Which absolutely. I guess was kind of a riff on that. Well, if you get a chance, man, just take a quick look at the the logo for Planet X, and you'll see that it's basically a riff off the Shaw Brothers logo. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the, yeah, that very bold P against the is it an X against the blue or an, an no? The P is it's, it's a yeah. yellow PX against the blue. The blue, blue that's right. it's, it, yeah. it's just it's the same as Shaw Brothers, except it's PX instead of SB. Yeah, I mean, without without the Grindhouse Kung Fu movies, we wouldn't have gotten um, The Last Dragon, which is one of my favorite movies. Um, the, the Last Dragon, that's, that, I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, yeah. Again, not, not a, I don't feel like that's a Grindhouse movie. I don't either, but it's definitely a tribute. For, for sure a tribute. But that, that movie, along with The Warriors, has the best representation of what... New York City was like before the pre, the, the was before the Giuliani cleanup. That that movie again, along with the Warriors, is like they they take the the city so seriously that it's like a whole extra character in the movie. So the other biggest character behind Bruce Leroy is New York, and that's something that again the new Ghostbusters Afterlife movie was not Grindhouse, but I felt the lack of New York City. Like I feel like that if you're going to make a book, Ghostbusters movie. That uh, that New York City is a character, just like the Enterprise is a character in a Star Trek episode. You know, it's just That's like a very, very good point. You're absolutely right. So, but evidently, the next Ghostbusters movie, they're taking them back to New York City. So, um, but anyway, Ghostbusters, I would not categorize, categorize as, as Grindhouse by any means. Oh, good but, lord! No. Yeah, <laughs> but, no. uh, but even um, you know, you were talking about the Bruce exploitation. You know, even in The Last Dragon, the main character renamed himself Bruce Leroy. You know, um, and of course, you had shown up Shogun, and and I'm 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 stretching here. I'm just shooting from the hip, but I feel like that. You know, you're talking about that they were playing these movies in these impoverished neighborhoods, so these sensibilities of the movies got into those neighborhoods, and I think that that could have been reflected in. You know, you've got a you've got a, a villain calling himself the Show Enough Shogun, <laughs> you know, running around uh, in a in a gritty New York neighborhood. So, but anyway, if if you've never seen, obviously, I'm talking to listeners here. If you've never seen The Last Dragon, you've got to go check it out. It's a wonderful example of a of a of an almost perfect '80s movie. And of course, I think the bad guy is like a cable TV dude or something. Uh, you know, therefore, the 
uh, uh, record producers and TV producers and stuff became villains in the movies. So, yeah, it's like it's yeah. right. It's right as the time of like cocaine consumerism. Like American yeah. Psycho is sort of like a uh, villainous type of type of guys uh, was really at its height. You know, that Gordon Gecko um, sort of sort of idea of, of of a bad guy. But the real star of of Last Dragon to me is not Bruce Leroy. It's not Ty Mac. It's um, it's shown up. Shona, the show Shona. Harlem. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. he is hands down to me one of the top five villains in Grindhouse cinema. Period, He's and that great. includes that that includes Michael Myers. That includes Leatherface. See, I'm a big Michael Myers fan, so we might have to talk about that. But Shona Shogun, he just owns the screen. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. He he is he is when when he's on screen, you can cannot take your eyes off it. He is. Yeah. He, you know, he like he has like what, like sixteen minutes in the whole entire movie. Yeah, he's or not in it very much. Yeah, but, but he is. Yeah. He is one of the. He's like the Darth Vader of 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 exploitation films. He's awesome. I was just to say he's a very Darth Vader figure, and of course, he's the challenge that forces Bruce Leroy to rise to the occasion and achieve the glow. Of course. Yeah. So. Who's the master? Yeah. <laughs> so good. So, I, I think I'm just gonna have to go watch that again today because it's such a great movie. Um, troll, troll two, troll two first. Troll two, and then and then the last dragon. So tell me, I like those kung fu. I love those cheesy kung fu movies that would, you know, it's the lips were out of sync with the dubbing, and uh, you know, such great memories. Well, had them. Them. <laughs> yeah, or you had the the crazy stuff like the guy throwing the hat that would chop your head off, and just, yeah, that's just, um, uh, was it Master of the Flying Guillotine? Yeah, just great stuff. And then yeah, what well, it looks like. So on on uh, Grindhouse database, looks like a couple of these kung fu or movies made it in. One was the Master of the Flying Guillotine. Uh, another one that I see popping up a lot is Five Fingers of Death. Uh, mm-hmm. Which which that gets referenced a lot. You got a band called Five Finger Death Punch, and then you've got, of course, uh, in Kill Bill Volume Two, it's directly referenced. You know, uh, there's there's a a five five finger punch or something like that that will kill you. Five finger uh, death touch. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. So and of course, I mean, we haven't even you've mentioned Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino is unabashedly a Grindhouse fan. Up to and including where he, you know, I, I consider uh, Kill Bill a massive grindhouse homage or whatever. It's a masterpiece. But, yeah, I love. I saw Kill Bill Volume One in the theater, and I mean, it blew me away. I walked out ready to walk right back in, and like everybody else, I saw it with was kind of like I was ready to walk right back up and buy a ticket and go right back into it. It, it was amazing. Um, part two was still very good. But part one just blows me away. Um, I think part two is actually the better film, uh, personally. Well, part two is more of a a movie. Part one is more of a experience. I don't know how to. So part uh, uh, part two has my favorite fight scene in any movie. Period. It's where the bride and L driver have the face off in the trailer. Yeah, it has. That's my favorite fight scene in any movie. And I, I rank it right up there with like like uh, the church scene and the. In the Kingsman, oh, I, that scene! I, I rank wow. it up there with uh, with the hallway, the hammer hallway scene, and the old boy. Yeah, I was gonna, yeah. I was gonna ask how you thought that compared to those the stairwell scene in Daredevil. I mean, all kinds of good stuff. Yeah, there's there's that scene in the Daredevil series that's very inspired by or whatever the old boy fight. Um, that's in it, season one. Now in season two, they have this, the stairwell fight where he goes and confronts all the bikers in the stairwell. Okay, I haven't. Um, really, they're, they're they're not, I haven't. I haven't seen season two. I watched season one with my wife, but we've never kept going with it. Um, I want to. Just it's, we're in a an embarrassment of riches on TV and movies right now. It's hard to keep yeah, up. Oh, you know, very much so. Yeah. I, that's, that's, that's why when I see people on Facebook just complaining about the latest Star Wars movie or. You know, the Thor Ragnarok was too funny, or what? I, right. I, I just, I get out of here because I, I, you know, there's so listen, much. Man, there's, yeah. there's so much that you have all the sugar, and you're being so salty. It it really is an embarrassment of riches. Of of it's a it's a it's a another golden era of TV. You know, people thought streaming and 
time shifting TiVo was going to kill TV, but no, it just forced people to make better stuff to keep the eyeball on it. Um, I mean, just think about what we got only in the last few months. We got, uh, we got a Kenobi series. We right. got a Boba Fett series. We got the boys. We have the end of Peaky. We have like the final season of Peaky Blinders. You have better call Saul. Better call Saul is one of the best TV shows ever made. Um, it's better than Breaking Bad. It's, it's way better than Breaking Bad, in my opinion. I mean, Breaking Bad was groundbreaking, amazing TV. Uh, but I would rank Better Call Saul as and you just I get shows thinking about Better Call Saul. I love Better Call Saul. Um, it's, yeah, it's a it's a fantastic, fantastic show. Such a good show. Such a good show. Um, well, let me kind of taking it back to Grindhouse. Um, so would you, like, I'm a huge fan of, like, the 60s and 70s Godzilla movies and Kaiju yes, movies. Where, so would those, would you consider those Grindhouse? No, although I would consider them Grindhouse adjacent, okay. obviously, because um, they, they did see, they did see uh, play in the old Grindhouse theaters. I mean, not not all of them, um, but some of them did, did, did show up. Um, but there, are, there's obviously a, a, a similar aesthetic between uh, between some of some some of the entries in Grindhouse cinema and with the Godzilla stuff, you know. Um, any like going back to our, our you know how not how not all uh, uh, Grindhouse films are are pieces of bubblegum pop, you know. Like the original Godzilla had very serious themes, you know. Well, it was um, it was uh, it was a, a psychological reaction to. Hiroshima and yeah, uh, only, only, yeah, only later did you see kind of the in, in, you know the embarrassment of of uh of riches when it came to the the crazy kaiju that was the only right. later did, did you get all that yeah no yeah but the original Godzilla movie horror movie I mean you can watch it as a sci-fi movie but from a Japanese perspective that's a horror movie um and then it's interesting because Godzilla, the first Godzilla, was basically talking about an atom bomb going off. Um, that was that was the subtext. And then, have you seen Shin Godzilla? Oh yeah, L- listen, man, I, I love kaiju and monster movies right. and, and Godzilla so much. I wrote a I wrote a hundred and forty eight page module about <laughs> about kaiju. So I, I'm 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 way deep into it, man. Okay, well, so Shin Godzilla was. A national reaction or a reaction to how they handled the was it Fukushima nuclear power plant situation. It was uh, if you watch it through that lens, uh, you have an emerging situation that the government is just mishandling left and right. Some of it because the bureaucracy just doesn't know how to handle it. Some of it because people are more worried about saving face than they are doing a good job. Uh, and if you watch Shin Godzilla from that perspective, that's exactly what they're talking about. So it's 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 pretty interesting, you know. Um, and that movie, not only is it a great movie, but it like it kind of transcended. Like it won. It not only I think it was either the or one of the highest movies in Japan the year it came out, but it won their equivalent of the Academy Award. So you can use kaiju and godzilla for you know although i love to watch giant monsters beat the crap out of each other like uh godzilla versus kong the new one i want to see a giant month month or giant monkey punch a lizard i'm I'm okay with that yeah same but but if you want to go deeper and uh you know have subtext and all this stuff kaiju can handle it you know you can you can tell a pretty powerful story with kaiju is the ostensible what you know uh story but you know with subtext underneath you know when, when, one more thing when you mention kaiju is like i i don't even think that kaiju when you have when you have a, a story about kaiju i don't even know that they need to be um the main focus of thing i think a lot of times kaiju work better um in the way that zombies work in the in the walking dead okay so in the walking dead zombies aren't the biggest problem it's the it's other people other people but I mean, you know, you have children that can take out the, the zombies, and I, I think you know, kaiju, kaiju at large—they're really just an environmental disaster. Because it isn't like kaiju are singling out certain people and trying to, to stomp right. on them. You're, right. you know, we're just a, we're, we're just like 
insects or mice running beneath your feet, you know? Right. So they work better to me as, as an environmental uh, challenge or something that can be turned against uh, uh, your players or, you know, something that can be, if, if you're watching a movie that, that they're the, they're the result of you having, you having done something bad. What, what other, I guess, type of grindhouse movie uh, that I want to touch on here is the, is the giallo, the Italian. Oh yeah. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't have thought of this as grindhouse because like Argento makes pretty artistic move. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't think of the grindhouse, but maybe the way they came to America was through the grindhouse circuit. I don't know. But no, that's, that, that's exactly it. That's ex- exactly why they're, they're considered that is because with the way that they, that they came over here and were introduced to American audiences was in grindhouse uh, cinema. Okay. Cause in Italy, I don't think they're, com- they're considered, or at least a lot of those movies are considered like high or good movies or whatever. So, um, well, not a lot of them are, are, a lot of them are great movies. Yeah. <laughs> well, the one that keeps making the grindhouse list is Suspiria. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And I just watched Joe Bob just covered one of the, one of his movies. I can't remember what the name of it was, but it was pretty good. It was about a writer whose uh, murders from his books were getting reenacted. I can't remember the name of it, but it, it was pretty darn good. So the name of the Dario Argento movie I was trying to remember is Tenebra. I think I'm saying that right. It's T E N E B R A E. And the, uh, the last drive-in episode with Joe Bob Briggs that uh, he shows that movie and gives his usual um, very interesting and insightful commentary on it is is currently on Shutter. If you have the Shutter streaming service, you could go check it out. I didn't do that on purpose, but Joe Bob likes it. He'll say, Joe Bob says, check it out. So Shane Plays says, check it out on Joe Bob. So you can hear Joe Bob say, Joe Bob says, check it out. And, and I think that's another kind of subgenre of Grindhouse is movies that in their own country, they're not considered, you know, whatever, but, but like you pointed out, the way they made it into America. It, it's just like one of the reasons New Wave got popular and all these British artists got popular in the 80s was because MTV was just starting and they could get these British videos cheaply. So they were they were just running that stuff on MTV because they needed content and they could get it relatively cheaply. But then all of a sudden it became popular, you know. So anyway, you mentioned uh, Evil Dead Two, Troll Troll Two, and Samurai Cop. Are there any other uh, movies you want to throw out there real quick before you got to go? Well, uh, you know, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, of course. Um, I think that, that again, a, a vastly underrated film. Um, Chiodo Brothers for Life. Uh, <laughs> those guys are... Because what's, what's, what's the name of it? For Life? Chiodo Brothers for Life? No, or? no, no. Chiodo Brothers is uh, the, the folks who made Killer Clowns Better Space. Oh, okay. Gotcha. All right. I like the, the Duffer Brothers of the 80s. But yeah, listen, if, if you just go online and start poking around and, and look in and... You're going to find Rock and Roll Nightmare. You're going to find, you know, Exterminator, Exterminator Two. You're going to, you're going to end up with Hills Have Eyes. You're going to, you're going to find all kinds of of, of dirty, yeah. grimy little, little little pictures, or just you know, you're going to find the Video Dead or Terror Vision or you know any of those kind of. You're going to find demons and demons too, for also from Italy. That's, uh, that's right. Yeah. You're going to find nuns with. With guns, you're going to find uh, Foxy Brown. You're going to find all kinds of crazy stuff. So, The 36th Chamber of Shaolin, you can't beat it. You can't. But yeah, there's a lot of wonderful stuff out there um, that is not slick, is not. Uh, and that, that's part of its attraction and part of its charm. Of course, there's one of the most famous revenge movies ever made, I Spit on Your Grave. Um, there's so much stuff out there. So, and as Levi mentioned earlier, know what you're getting into because some of this stuff can be really brutal and in your face um, and deal with themes that, you know, you may not want your 10 year old kid, you know, like, hey, let's go watch this old movie, son. No, you don't. No, don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> do it, it's, it's, it's hard to watch a film like uh, Lady Snowblood or, um, oh, they call her One Eye or something like that, um, thriller in the United States, um, that without, with the help, having to put out that that warning first because those are 
rough flicks to, to watch if you're unprepared. Yeah. So would you consider the original final last question? And it's not all just horror movies, but would you consider the original Friday 13th Grindhouse? I know it was definitely independent. No, I don't think I would, actually. Um, I think I really throw that more in because because here's the thing is that 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 movie came out at just the right time when they were they were looking for for slashers. I have to throw a footnote here that Black Christmas doesn't get enough. uh respect for kind of kicking off what we think of as the as the slashers of the 70s and the 80s but anyway well, black, go ahead. black christmas and halloween was a big one um but then uh, right as the studios were starting to look for more of these slashers boom they had they had friday the 13th and instead of making its its start in little grindhouse theaters or little little crappy shoddy theaters throughout the country it got the 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 full court press right off the bat um, so while it didn't cost very much to make, it got promoted like one of the big boys. And it, it, just as soon as it caught on, man, it became a phenomenon. I think they had a sequel to it. And I want to say in, in less than a year, there was a sequel. Yeah, so, that um, was quick. yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, I, it, it's just, to me, it doesn't, it doesn't really fit the criteria, but, um, maybe if it had grown from more from word of mouth or it, it had right. spent some time in those, in those low budget theaters, then maybe, but to me, to me, under my personal definitions, I, I it, it just misses the mark. Okay. Fair enough. Well, folks go to, uh, shameplays.com and I'll have show notes for this episode and I'll have links to, you know, the, the database, the grindhouse database, 20 best, the, uh, you know, so you can kind of look through and start your journey here. We barely scratched the surface. There's so yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, so so said You know, I mean, I'm looking at some here I've never even heard of. It's it's number 18 on our top 20 called Vampiros Lesbos from 19. So I have no idea. So it's, I, have, it's just, I have that on I have that on DVD. <laughs> well, there you go. You are you're a true Grindhouse fan. Okay, well Levi, um, I've got to I got to I got to end this with the bad joke of the week. It has to happen. So. With, with your uh, Grindhouse movie love, this should not be too much of a psychic damage to you. But here we go. What do you call a cow with no legs? Ground beef. That is true, sir. Yes. Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. What do you call a cow with three legs? Uh, Tri-tip. Lean beef. No lean beef. beef. The correct answer was lean beef. <laughs> Folks, don't forget, it's Levi Combs. Check out planet x games for the best in uh in rpg products and zines all right levi thanks so much for coming on yeah thanks for having me on shane oh man so glad to have you yeah we'll catch everyone else next time on shane plays geek talk thanks so much for listening to shane plays geek talk i certainly hope you enjoyed this journey into the things we love for your convenience, show notes with helpful links for each episode can always be found at shameplays.com. You can catch the podcast in several places, including on the blog at shameplays.com, iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Podbean, Amazon Music, Verbal, YouTube, and more. If you like what you hear and would like to support Shame Plays Geek Talk, you can do so for as little as $1 per episode on Patreon at patreon.com slash shameplays. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Stay geeky, my friends.